the Doran's annual lecture series. I would just like to begin by introducing the Dean of our faculty, Professor Boaz Shamir, who will give a few preliminary comments. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, this is the second Doran lecture. And for those of you uh, who are not here uh, in the first Doran lecture, uh, let me say that uh, uh, this, this uh, series of lectures was initiated uh, and is supported by uh, the Doran family from Great Britain. Uh, I think the idea was of Benjamin Doran, who is Alan Doran's father. Alan Doran is the man with the beard sitting here. Uh, and they uh, initiated a series of lectures on issues related to population growth and development. And uh, we are very lucky that uh, they also uh, offered to uh, uh, enable us, to give us the support that enabled us to bring visitors, uh, distinguished scholars from abroad, to give uh, uh, lectures in this series. Uh, so, first of all, let me thank the Doran family and uh, also uh, thank the people who uh, 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 organized this uh, second lecture. Guy Steckler, who is not here, he is on sabbatical. Barbara Oaken, uh, who is here. Uh, and uh, the people from the Department of Economics, Ethan Shishinsky and others, and, and uh, 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 Neta Zinger and Marcy, who, who took uh, care of the logistics. And I'd like, of course, to thank Professor Joel Cohen from Rockefeller University and Columbia University, uh, who will be introduced by, by uh, Barbara Oaken, but uh, uh, I know enough to know that he is a very distinguished scientist in his field, and we are honored and lucky, so thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed the lecture. I'd just like to take this opportunity to invite Mr. Doran to to Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I'm very glad to be here representing the family at the second lecture. Um, I spoke to my dad yesterday. Um, he's now 95. He sends his very best wishes to Professor Cohen and uh, everyone else for the, for the lecture. Um, last year, uh, he wasn't here, but uh, he enjoyed listening to the um, Billy's to lead a slightly contrarian approach, which I, those of you who were here will, will remember. Uh, he wasn't convinced, though, that we should stop worrying about overpopulation and leave it to the, uh, the, uh, the power of the naked free market. He, he didn't buy that message. Um, he's looking forward to uh, continuing um, broadening this, this debate. He's absolutely uh, vital issues which which we all face and um, I think he's got a private bet with the Almighty about um, just how many of these uh, series he's going to be able to attend but well, I don't know uh, I don't know the details of that um, it's interesting that uh, today um, my mother's family the Rifes are also represented here my cousin Dr. Joseph Rife um, has brought me here from Pataitikva and I had no idea that he has a very intimate connection with Mount Scopus. He was here in uh, 1966 um, as a member of one of the convoys who are guarding the territory um, against the Jordanians. He was uh, a doctor in the uh, army at that time and he remembers sleeping out in the cold here when there were no, no roofs or buildings, just, just broken walls. Um, so and he hasn't been here actually since since then. So uh, very pleased that um, that he's making that uh, reconnection. Um, and um, well, I'm I'm delighted, as I say, that um, lecture two is is about to start. And very pleased that Professor Cohen is, is here. So thank you. about what the future may hold for us 
both personally and for collectively for the human population. One of the things that demography and social science teaches us in general is that our individual behavior affects and are greatly affected by the lives of the people in the communities, countries, and world we live in. Individual behaviors seemingly determined at the micro level through the decisions of persons and their families aggregate up to community level behaviors and to even higher level macro behaviors. Then the feedback mechanisms operate when macro level behaviors turn in turn affect micro level decisions. Nobody can fast forward to the future and give us an exact portrait of what human life will look like 40 years from now. But demographers and other social scientists can make a variety of reasonable assumptions about future changes in human behavior and project forward the implications of these varied assumptions in order to give us a range of possible futures to consider. How can our behavior today and in the coming years affect which of these, those possibilities is most likely to unfold as our reality? To give us a glimpse of our possible futures, we are very fortunate this year, through the generosity of the Duran Fund in Population, Resources, and Economic Development, to have with us Professor Jolie Kohn. Professor Kohn is currently Abby Rockefeller Mouse Professor of Populations at the Rockefeller University in New York City. He is also Professor of Populations at the Earth Institute of Columbia University, where he holds a joint appointment in the Department of Earth and Environmental Sciences the Department of Ecology, Evolution, and Environmental Biology, and the School of International and Public Affairs. Professor Coyne received his BA degree in mathematics from Harvard University and earned a PhD in applied mathematics from Harvard. He also received from Harvard another doctorate in population sciences and tropical public health. He has since taught or lectured at a variety of institutions such as Harvard University, Stanford University, Technion Israel Institute of Technology and the University of California. Professor Cohen was named one of America's top 100 young scientists by Science Digest in 1984. His research has won him numerous awards, including the Mindel Sheffs Award from the Population Association of America, the Distinguished Statistical Ecologist Award, and the Tyler Prize for Environmental Achievement. He is also currently a member of the National Academy of Sciences, the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, and the American Philosophical Society. Uh, Dr. Coyne's research examines groups of living beings and their interactions. He and his colleagues combine mathematical tools with observations of concrete problems in demography, epidemiology, and ecology. Dr. Coyne's work has contributed in important ways to policy-related debates including the relationship between population growth and the Earth's sustainability, and more recently, on universal education around the world. Thank you, Professor Cohen, for joining us today. Thank you very much, Barbara, for that extensive and generous introduction. <laughs> Thank you, Alan Doran, for representing your family here and for supporting this series. I didn't see who Dr. Wright is. Who is Dr. Wright? Could you put your hand up so we can see who you are? Right there. How do you do, sir? Thank you for being here. It's an honor to be in the same room with you. So thank you for being here. Thank you, Dean, for sponsoring this and for being here. And I'd like to thank um, the three members of the selection committee uh, Moshe Hazan, Etan Shoshinsky, and Guy Steckloff for their excellent taste this year. <laughs> and I'd like to thank Barbara Oaken for being a very gracious and generous host throughout my visit here and in preparation. And I really appreciate that a lot. And I'd like to thank Netta and Marcy for the work that goes into making everything happen and making it pleasant. So, thank you. And I'd like to thank you for being here. So, uh, as, uh, as, Barbara st as Barbara said, uh, I do demography. You know the definition of a demographer. It's somebody who has a flair for numbers, but doesn't have the personality to be a bookkeeper. So, uh, let's see if we can 
go forward here. I want to, I want to try to accomplish a lot. I've got one hour of your time. And after that, we're going to have discussion for about 25 to 30 minutes. It's now 6.16, okay? I'm going to do my very best to end, well, certainly not later than 7.15, but if I can make it by 7, that would be great. But I've got one hour, and uh, here we go. This is the most important slide in the talk. I try to express visually here that it does not make sense to talk about population in isolation from economics, the environment, and culture, including values. If you are an economist, and there are some economists in this room, please feel free to turn this picture with economics at the top. And if you are an ecologist, please feel free to turn this with the environment at the top. If you're an anthropologist, put culture at the top. This is supposed to be an image of a tetrahedron, a triangular base with population at the top. And it's, rota it's symmetric, and you can rotate it any way you want. The theme that's going to go through this whole talk is the interactions between population, economics, environment, and culture. And I give it to you as a checklist so that when you leave here and you hear someone giving you a simple explanation of a complicated situation, you can refer to this checklist and say, did that person consider population, economics, environment, and culture? And so I propose to you a homework assignment for you to do for yourself. 24 hours from now, at 6.18 tomorrow, see if you can remember what these four topics were. Population, economics, environment, and culture. Look at your watch and say, oh yes, that's what he said. Okay. Uh, no. Well, I have to. Okay. Let's see. Okay. I think there's a faster way, but I'll work, figure that out. So here's the outline. Part one, history. Part two, future. Part three, where can we intervene? And the history will cover population, economics, environment, and culture. Can, you, can I have the next slide, please? Just, just click, push. That's it. Good, perfect. So population in the past, and then I'm going to talk about economics in the past, environment and culture in the past. I'm going to do this in less than 20 minutes. Next. This is the standard picture from 2,000 years ago up to 2,000 to this day. Around the time of Christ, there were roughly a quarter of a billion people on the planet. It took 15 centuries to double that to half a billion. Now, is this curve exponential growth or not? No. Why not? Why not? Who said no? Did you say no? What, why not? Okay. Okay, let me explain quickly. In exponential growth, your doubling time is constant. If you put your money in a bank at 3%, it takes 23 years to double, and then it'll take another 23 years to double again, and another 23 years to double. That's exponential growth by definition. Now, it took 15 centuries to go from a half a billion, sorry, a quarter of a billion to half a billion, around 1,500. Then people discovered the new world, and new crops like corn and potatoes and tomatoes. And the food supply improved and death rates dropped and the population doubled from half a billion to a billion in 300 years, around 1800, 1830. Then Industrial Revolution, you may have heard of it, went from 1 billion to 2 billion in 100 years. So we went 1500 years 300 years, 100 years. Then, 
antibiotics, public health measures. We went from 1 billion to, sorry, from 2 billion to 4 billion, 1930, 74, 44 years. The most recent doubling from 3 to 6 billion was from 1960 to 1999, 39 years. Let's round it to 40 years. We went from 1,500 years to 44 years to double, 30 years, 40 years. That's super exponential growth. It's like a savings account where the interest rate goes up with the balance in the account. Okay? So we cannot say that population grew exponentially. It grew super exponentially. World population has doubled since 1965. It has tripled since 1935. There are people in this room who have seen the population triple. I've seen it double. And no people other than those who lived through the main parts of the 20th century have ever seen that. It never happened before the 20th century, and it will never happen again. Now, I'd like to zoom in on a part of this slide. This slide is like a shower curtain. What it conceals is interesting. More interesting than what it reveals. So I'm going to zoom in to the last 50 years here. And we're going to... Next slide, please. Look, from 1950 to 2000, instead of population size, this is the growth rate. This is the interest rate on the account, okay? 1%, 2%, 3%. And these diamonds here show you the world's growth rate. And the growth rate had been going up and up and up because it's super exponential growth. And then around 1965, the most important event in human demographic history happened. And nobody noticed it at the time. We were not aware of it. And that was this peak in the population growth rate. So the interest rate reached a peak when the people of the poor countries realized that their children were surviving better. And they did not need to have eight children in order to take care of them, to, to take care of them in their old age. And when so the, the world's growth rate peaked at 2.1, 2%, maybe we don't know exactly, and has since fallen to about 1.1 or 1.2%. In other words, the growth rate has fallen by half in the last half century. That's the most important event in human demographic history. Now let's look at the details. The world has three parts in this picture. The rich countries are down here. The growth rate in the rich countries has been falling since the time of the French Revolution, when the fall began in France. American growth rate started falling around 1850. The whole West has been in a declining growth rate for the last hundred years, including the last half century. The corner was turned for the world when the poor countries, the less developed countries, reached a peak and then smartened up before the one-child policy. The growth rate in the less developed, excluding the least development, peaked and has dropped even more dramatically than the world's. And then the third part of the world is the least developed, 50 poorest countries. And their growth rate has been going up and has continued to go up and is only now giving a hint that it might be coming down. Next, please. That growth rate looks at huge regions, but there are very important differences between regions. This slide shows how big was the population size in 2000 compared to the population size in 1950. Europe increased by a factor of 1.3. That's a 30% increase. North America, 1.8. That's an 80% increase in half a century. Asia, 2.6. That's 160%. Latin America, 3.2. That's 220%. Sub-Saharan Africa and Middle East and North Africa, 
almost fourfold increase in one half century. <clears throat> Next slide. The 20th century was unique demographically. We had the highest global population growth rate in history, the only century when population doubled and tripled, and the largest voluntary decline in fertility. Both of those we're never going to see again. Next slide. I'm done with population history. Environment. Next slide. This is a plot from 1700 to 2000 of the main covers of the land. As population, remember 1700 we had about little, well about 600 million people, roughly, three quarters of a billion, something in there. As people converted land to farms and as people used the timber for the ships of the British Navy and for charcoal and for houses, forest and woodland contracted. Even more, the grasslands contracted as land was converted to pasture and cropland. Next slide. And the consequences are that if you plot on a logarithmic scale the number of people per square kilometer and the fraction of original habitat remaining among about 63 poor countries with incomes between seven hundred and four thousand dollars a year the curve goes like that that's the bad news the density increases and the fraction of land original cover goes down the good news is look at the situation here with a hundred people per square kilometer there's a huge range from practically no surviving natu natural habitat to a huge amount that means there's room for choice and action. You can ha accommodate this population density and you can preserve natural resources. Next slide. Not only did we change the land, we changed the atmosphere and the water under the land. So in 1900, humans emitted half a billion tons of carbon per year to the atmosphere. In 2000, we emitted 7.3 billion. Part of that was fossil fuel burning, and part of it was cutting forests and burning the, the forests. The ratio of half, divi dividing that into 7.3, a 15-fold increase over the century. Water withdrawals. This is in thousands of cubic kilometers, increased by a factor of eight over the century. This figure of 4,000 cubic kilometers is roughly half of all the easily available precipitation that falls out of the sky. Easily available means it's in a place where people can use it. This means we're not going to double this again because we can't use it all, we can't capture it all. So 15-fold increase in carbon, 8-fold increase in water, Nitrogen in NOx from fossil fuels increased by a factor of 20. Do you know why? Because Fritz Haber, a German chemist, in 1908 discovered the Haber-Bosch process for fixing atmospheric nitrogen. Nitrogen is the most abundant element in the atmosphere, 70%. And he found an energy-intensive way using a lot of electricity to convert it into nitrogen fertilizer, urea. And that has driven the population expansion. And it's also driven nitric acid deposition and lots of other applications of nitrogen. So we had a 20-fold increase. Remember I told you that the number of people in the 20th century went from 1.6 billion to 6.1 billion, less than a four-fold increase. So by just comparing the last column, we see that population growth fourfold has had a big impact, but does not account fully for the 20-fold increase in nitrogen, the 8-fold increase in water withdrawals, the 15-fold increase in carbon outputs. There's more going on. There's technological change, there's economic change, and there's cultural behavioral change. Next slide. 
Now we're done with the environment. Now we go on to economics. This is a picture I took in Bangalore. You can see the, the classy apartment buildings in the back and people living in tents, leaky tents, through the monsoons in the front. Next slide. Well, this is the energy production history over the last 150 years. The green is biomass. What's biomass? Wood and manure. The big growers are this gas. If that calls for me, I'm sorry, I can't take it. <laughs> gas. Anybody else who has a cell phone, you could turn it off if you wanted to. It was for you. Oh, thank you. Gas, oil, and coal all produce carbon. So the energy expanded, and that drove the economic growth largely in the 20th century. Next slide. This is a summary of the 20th century economy. In 1900, we had $1,250 per person income. It more than quadrupled by 2000, using the unit of 1990 Geary Camus dollars. The number of people didn't quite quadruple. So if you multiply four times four fold increase in both factors, you get 16. And the size of the world economy <clears throat> grew from 2 trillion to 32 trillion, a 16 fold increase in the century. It says down here more people live in poverty today than in 1900 if poverty means living on less than two dollars a day purchasing power parity. How is that possible? Well, in 1900 there were only 1.6 billion people. Today we have about 2.7 billion people living on less than two dollars a day. Next slide. If you look at different regions, income grew faster when population grew slower from 1950 to 2000. This is an important kind of generalization. So this is population as a multiple of the population in 1950. It's on a log scale. So let's look at Africa. And this, by the way, is GDP per person. Okay? Here's Africa. It starts over here and goes out to fourfold increase in population with very little rise in income. Latin America goes out not as far as Africa, but has a slightly steeper slope. The United States goes less far out as, than Latin America in population growth, but a steeper slope. And Western Europe, their population hardly grew at all. Didn't even double. But their income tripled, almost quadrupled, quadrupled. Okay? So you can, have, you, you can have one or the other. You can have people or you can have income. Next slide. I'm done with economics. I hope you economists are impressed. Now we're going to talk about a culture in the past. What's the most important cultural event of the 20th century? Next slide. The spread of elementary school. 1900, most children did not go to elementary school. 2000, most children went to elementary school. That is a colossal achievement, but it's incomplete, especially in South Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa. Next slide. So I've covered the past. I want to give you a synopsis of where we are today before we go on to the future. And while I take a drink of water, if anybody wants to ask a question, this would be a great time. Okay. That was so inscrutable, there are no questions. And I took 20 minutes to do that. Let's do the future in 20 minutes. Next slide. Oh, next slide, please. To simplify slightly, there are two worlds on the planet, the rich and the poor. The rich world has 6.7 billion. The, sorry, one, the world as a whole has 6.7. The rich world has 1.2, and the poor has about four and a half times as many, 5.5. Okay? Why do we call them rich and poor? Per capita income in the rich is $31,000 a year. 
and in the poor it's under five. What fraction live on less than two bucks a day? In the rich world, you can't live on less than two dollars a day. Nobody can do that. In the poor world, 48%, almost half, are living on less than two dollars a day. If you haven't been to a developing country, you should go because it will expand your horizons of what people can put up with, especially poverty. How's the population growth rate going? In the rich countries, it's two-tenths of a percent. That means if that rate were to continue, it would take five times 70 or 350 years for the population to double. In the poor countries, it's growing at 1.5 percent a year. That means it's going to take about 45 or 50 years for the population to double at a constant growth rate. So as I said in an earlier slide, the population of the poor countries is expanding rapidly, but the incomes are low. Well, the growth rates are also low. Some are. Anyway, that's another question. Okay. How many live with AIDS? AIDS. One percent in the poor countries, half a percent in the rich countries. Infant mortality rate. Your chance of dying if you're an infant born in a poor country is 54 per thousand, or five and a half percent, roughly. It's nine times smaller in a rich country. So there's inequity at the very outset. The average number of children per woman is almost twice as high in the poor countries, 2.8 versus 1.6 per lifetime. Three quarters of rich people live in cities, less than half in poor countries. And this is something not widely appreciated. The population density in poor countries, number of people per square kilometer, is two and a half times larger than in the rich countries. The poor countries are not only poor, they're crowded. Next slide. The world is not an equal place. The top 2% of people have 51% of the wealth. For those who know what a Gini coefficient is, and I'm not going to explain it here, the global wealth Gini for adults is 89%. Perfect inequality, meaning I have all the money and you have nothing, would be 100%. So we're pretty close to that. Everybody in this room is in the upper end of this. And it would be much more unequal if we included children. This is just for adults. Why? Because the poor people have more children than the rich people. So this is an underestimate of the real genie. Next slide, please. Do we have enough food? Yes and no. The guy goes into a psychiatrist, says, doctor, help me. I don't know which leg to put in my pants first when I get up. She says, and what else? And he says, and then I don't know which leg to step forward with when I stand up. And he sa she says, and what else? And he says, I don't know which hand to use to open the door with. She says, tell me. Do you have trouble making decisions? He says, yes and no. <laughs> so do we have food abundance? Yes and no. The world last year grew two billion tons of cereal, grains. How much does it take to feed me for a year? One fifth of a ton. That's 200 kilograms. That's roughly 400 and something pounds and I need a pound of bread a day there are 400 days in the year so a fifth of a ton is enough for each person in this room to eat enough to live not a great diet but it's enough we could be feeding 10 billion people an adequate vegetarian diet with those grains so how come we've got a billion hungry people because 37 to 40 percent of the grain is fed to domestic animals to grow meat for people who can afford it. For every three kilograms that go into a human mouth, we take two kilograms and put it in an animal mouth. Consequently, billions are chronically malnourished. A billion people, 0.9, but it's really a billion, are chronically undernourished. 
markets do not reflect other people's hunger. They simply don't exist in food markets because they don't have any economic means of exerting demand. They are economically invisible. Do we have enough abundance of food? Yes and no. Next slide. So look, I've covered history, population, economics, environment, and culture. Now it's time to go to the future. And let me summarize before we get there. Four words to take home. Bigger, slower, older, more urban. That's one word. I can't count. Next, next slide. That was a joke. All right. What do projections of the future assume? They assume business as usual. No more surprises in the future than in the past. And we've had plenty of surprises in the past. So we'll have plenty of surprises in the future. We assume no nuclear war, no lethal pandemics, no climatic catastrophes, no comet impacts that wipe out the human species. Forget that. It could happen, but we can't deal with that. The projections specify trajectories of fertility. How many children will you have? How many children will my daughter have? We make assumptions. You might not pay attention to my assumptions. In that case, the projections will not work out right. A continued slow decline in fertility, a gradual improvement in length of life, limited and decreasing migration. And generally, the projections assume that the world will homogenize. That's a very unrealistic assumption. And I don't really have a lot of confidence in the details of these projections. On the other hand, they're the best we've got. I don't think any demographer would agree, would disagree with the main trends that I'm going to give you, but there's uncertainty. Next slide. Why is migration increasing instead of fact? It's not a fact. It's because we don't know what else to say. It used to be, <clears throat> excuse me, the UN projections for migration used to go out to 2030 and then drop to zero. And several people pointed out to the UN Population Division that that was kind of ridiculous. So now they go out to 2030, expanding like this, increasing numbers of migrants, and then they just level off and flatten out and stay at that level. That's also ridiculous. It's the best we've got. I'm trying to develop mathematical models to do better than that, and that's another talk. So, yeah, it's not very reasonable. On the other hand, migration plays a very small role in global population size. It does have an effect, but it's not a big player. There are only about 175 million people today on the planet living outside of the country of their birth. And remember, 175 million, that's less than one-fifth of a billion. It's a few percent, two to three percent. Thank you for a good question. Next slide, please. <clears throat> yes, sir. Uh, regarding the first line, can't you weigh differently occurrences in the near past than occurrences in the far past? Yes. And in fact, that's a good question. Did you hear the question? Can you weight differently occurrences in the near past from occurrences in the far past? And that's a very good idea. And in fact, these projections look at recent trends and weight those more than things that happened further back, which is a way of implementing your idea. Yeah. Next slide, please. Thank you. The fundamental difficulty in projecting population is that pop you may have seen this picture before. Population interacts with economics, the environment, and culture. And culture, economics, and the environment are at least as hard to project as population. How many people foresaw the global meltdown of our economy? Not that many. Next slide. So this is my crystal ball. You have been warned. Take this with a grain of salt or two or three. Next slide. Population will be bigger. Whether it will be poor or rich depends on the choices we make now. It will be more slowly growing. Whether the population growth will end by 2050 
depends on the choices we make now. It will be older. There will be a higher number and a higher proportion of elderly. Their abilities or disabilities depend on choices we make now. It will be more urban. Virtually all growth in cities, all the growth, this two to four billion will be in cities, in poor countries. The quality of the cities depends on the choices we make now. Is there a recurrent theme? It's that we have choices to make now and they matter tremendously for what the shape of the future will be. There are two other factors that I think are important and there's so much uncertainty and disagreement about them that I'm not going to talk about them here. One of them is international migration and it says here likely to rise. You see, I agree with you. Second is families and households. They are likely to be transformed. If I have time to talk about that, I will. Otherwise, I won't. Barbara Oaken can tell you more about it. She should be up here talking about that part. Next slide, please. So bigger. This is history. 1600, we were at about uh, half a billion. We reached 2 billion in 1930. We reached 6 billion in 2000. We're going to go from 6 to basically 9 by 2050. So a 50% increase. The expected increase in between 2008 and 2050 equals the entire world's population in 1950. So we'll take a copy of the world in 1950 and add it. Almost all the increase will be in poor countries and relatively more in the poorest countries. Next slide, please. It's not going to be even. It's a horse race. So as you know, China is the biggest country in the world. Not for long. India is about to overtake and Africa in about 20... 25 years will overtake both, I know Africa is not a country, it's a continent, but it will overtake both China and India. There's no food in Africa. Uh, that's a problem. Yeah. Dan said there's no food in Africa. To say that there is no food is not precise, it's an approximation, and a good approximation, Roughly one-third of the African population is chronically hungry. One person out of three. That is a scandal. There's no reason for that. I mean, there are reasons for it, but they're not good reasons. And it depends what we do as to what will happen to those people and their children. Meanwhile, Europe has peaked and is in slow decline. The United States is leveling off. So it's a shifting world. It will be a world of Africans, Indians, and Chinese, dominantly, with a few oddballs like Europeans and Americans. Next slide, please. That's the first point. Second is slower. This is the homogenization. We're here in 2000 or 2010. This is the homogenization of birth rates. If you believe that, I'd like to sell you the Brooklyn Bridge. Uh, this is the world's growth rate. It has gone down. And the difference between the past and the future is that the past is irregular. It's like a bumpy road. And the future is smooth. And I don't think that's going to happen. Next slide. But I do believe that birth rates will come down. And how fast they come down and where depends on what we choose to do. Next slide. Slower growth, slow decline. OK. Today, the developed countries absorb 5% of population growth. The total growth of the world is about 79 million a year. Let's say 80 million a year. The developing countries, 95%. So most of the growth of that 80 million overwhelmingly is going to the countries least able to provide for the people. By 2050, the developed countries as a whole will be declining by about a million people a year the less developed will add about 13 million and the least developed will add 19 million so we'll have 19 plus 13 minus 1 is a 31 million per year increase so we're dropping from 80 million a year to 30 million a year increase overall that is a slowing of growth but it's not equally distributed 
the least developed countries are going to be growing. 1920, this is the population of Australia, 20 million. Add in Australia every year, while Europe and the rich countries will be declining by a million a year. Next slide, please. The differences in the slowing of growth will affect schools and armies. So let's look at the number of the actual number of people aged 15 to 24. That's your university age and your army age. What's the change from 2005 to 2050? For the world as a whole, it goes up 3%. For the rich countries like us, it goes down 19%. 20%, let's say, 19%. For the less developed, excluding the least, because their fertility is falling, it goes down by 9%. For the least developed 50 countries, it goes up by 80 86%. It goes up by 86%, almost a doubling. So if you're fighting wars with armies, guess who has the advantage? If you have a lot of young men looking for work, something preferably nonviolent, where's the problem the most acute? Right there, least developed. Next slide, please. Okay, we've talked about bigger, slower. Next is older. The numbers and fraction of older people will increase everywhere, first in the rich countries and then in the poor. Next slide. From now on, the world will have fewer young people than old people. Next slide. So here's the, the statistical evidence. In 1950, the fraction of people in the whole world who were zero to four years old was around 13 percent. It peaked up during the baby boom in some countries and then dropped to 10 percent in 2000 and is projected to drop to about 7 percent. The fraction of people aged 60 plus, which includes one or two people in this room, was at 8 percent in 1950, rose to exactly 10 percent in 2000, and will go up to about 23 percent. So they're going to be three and a half times as many 60 pluses as zero to fours. That means the people this age, the old age, who have grandchildren will be in a lucky minority. There will not be enough grandchildren to go around. Next slide. A tsunami of population aging is on the way. The number of people 60 plus will triple by 2050. What happens to the population as a whole? It goes up 50%. But the number of 60 plus triples and the number of 80 plus quadruples. That's absolute numbers. So it means that the proportion of 60 year olds plus and 80 plus goes up tremendously. Next slide. Aging is happening in rich countries and poor. The relative increase of elderly is most rapid in some of the poorest countries because they have so few to begin with. The greatest numbers of elderly are in the more developed countries. Next slide, please. Aging is a problem brought to you by success. What are the two successes? Lower fertility and longer life. Lower fertility means you're pumping in fewer young people. Most people are born at age zero. It's a generalization, but it's a safe one. So they tend to be young for the first few years of their life. If you lower fertility, you lower the fraction of young people in the population. Also, longevity has improved. If you live longer, you have more older people. The fall, if you do the quantitative analysis, the fall in fertility contributes more to population aging than increasing length of life. If birth rates remain low and death rates remain low, population aging is irreversible. Next slide. Does that mean we're headed for a population of disabled people? Absolutely not. In the United States, well, let me tell you what an age-specific disability rate is. It's the, let, let's say we're taking 60-year-olds. The 60-year-old age-specific disability rate is the fraction of people age 60 who cannot do for themselves the ordinary activities of daily living. Get out of bed, get dressed, get washed, and get breakfast. 
That's the definition, okay? If you can do that, you're in fine shape. Okay. The age-specific disability rates in the United States have been dropping by 1.5% per year for the last quarter century. That's great news. So I saw a t-shirt in New York City. It said, 50 is the new 30. This is true. 60 is the new 40. 80 is the new 50. 100 is the new 60. Okay? Because we're doing better. And who does better especially? Educated people. Their disability rates drive this decline. What's the lesson? Educate people. It's cheaper than paying for nursing homes. Let people be functional. So education, good health behavior throughout life, leads to prolonged productivity, prolonged capacity. Next slide. Disability rates have been falling in Japan also, which has a longer life expectancy than the US, the longest in the world. Great declines and in Taiwan and Korea and other places. Next slide. Why does the shift to an aging population matter if we're talking about the environment? How's the connection between aging and the environment? Well, if you look at the age of the householder running from 10 up to 90 or 20 up to 90, and you look at transportation energy use in the United States, the older the head of the household, the less the energy used for transport but the more the, the residential energy use per person. So when you're shifting the population out towards the elderly, your residential energy use will go up and your transport will go down. What's the consequence? We should be designing buildings that are more energy efficient. There are things we can do to deal with the problem once you know that there is a problem there. Next slide. Older households demand more energy in the USA. And this just gives some more facts. Aggregated consumption in older households is more energy intensive than consumption in younger households. Next slide. It's not only the USA. This is China, that's India. There are a lot of people there. Those two countries have 40% of the world's population. As the age of the householder goes up, the share of expenditures for energy rises with the age of the household head. China, India. Next slide. Okay, we have talked about bigger, slower, older. Now we're going to talk about more urban. From 2007 on, urban people will outnumber rural people. This is the first time in human history that has happened. We've never had an urban world before, and we've never had an elderly world before, and we're going to have an elderly urban world, because those two things are going to go together. And we are not prepared for that world, I would say, as well as we should be. So let me simplify the next half century of demography. In the year 2000, we had 3 billion rural people and 3 billion urban people, half-half, roughly. In the year 2050, we take another 3 billion people and we add it to the urban end, and we keep the same 3 billion rural. It means that the farmers have to support twice as many urban people in 2050 as they did in 2000. All the added people will be in cities of poor countries. Next slide. Does rural mean farming? No, it means outside of a city. Now, if you ask me what a city means, I have to tell you I don't know. <laughs> it could be. It could be. Absolutely could be. But when I said I don't know, the fact is every country has its own definition of the split between urban and rural. So these numbers have a penumbra of uncertainty around them. We don't know exactly what they mean. Next slide. So to break it down in a little more detail, in the rich countries, the more developed countries, the rural population has been in slow decline for the last hundred years, while the urban population has been growing a little bit. In the poor countries, the rural population was growing, but is anticipated to level off around 2030 and stay flat around 3 billion. 
it's the urban population in the less developed countries that's really going up fast. Next slide, please. Most, will people live in the cities of 10 million and more? Absolutely not. Most added people will live in cities of intermediate size in poor countries. So 45% will live in cities under a million of the added people in the next 10 years or so. 45% will be in cities of a million, 28% in cities of one to five million. So it's that middle range that's going to get all the growth. The urban increments will be 93% in the less developed regions. This means that we have to build the equivalent of a city of one million people every five days from now to 2050. Is it a catastrophe for people to live in cities? If you're concerned about the environment, it's a good thing. Now, I live in New York City. We in New York City, our greenhouse gas emissions are 7.1 metric tons of carbon dioxide equivalent. The United States is 24.5. So we are 29% of the U.S. average. We're way down there. London is even more carbon dioxide efficient. Toronto is here. San Diego is here. San Francisco is there. Cities are more efficient in what they throw waste to the environment. Next slide, please. Isn't that because the agricultural sector, which lives in, which is rural, produces for us city people the food, and you're crediting this to them and not to us? That's part of the story, and it's true. On the other hand, the population density in the rural areas is much lower, but they use up a tremendous amount of fossil fuel in producing that food and in traveling around. So when people are spread out, the transport energy per person is much greater in the rural areas. But what you said is absolutely right. It's just not the whole, the whole story. But you're absolutely right. We in the cities are eating the farm that the farmers, the, the farm produce from, from the farmers. That's true. But if we look at passenger transport carbon dioxide, so now I'm just looking at transport. Passenger transport CO2 per person is lower in denser cities. The United States is the worst. And as it gets denser, the passenger transport CO2 goes down. Next. This slide is about China, the next one is about India, and it's interesting. In rural areas as defined in China, the energy in, the units don't matter here, is much higher than in towns, and that's higher than it is in cities. But the expenditure of people on energy is lower in the country bigger in towns and highest in the city. Why is that? This green thing is biomass. It's straw, it's manure, it's wood, it's cow chips. You don't get any of that in the towns and cities. Instead, people buy this yellow stuff, which is electricity, and electricity costs more. So the, and economists here have discovered the law of supply and demand. I hope this comes as news to you. If something costs more, you buy less of it. Energy costs more, people buy less of it. But the quality of the energy changes from biomass to electricity. Next slide. India, same story, exact same story. A little bit of electricity and rural electrification in India, more in the all urban, in the metropolitan areas most. The cost goes up in energy. Next slide, please. Urban growth could affect the food supply. In rough numbers, cities occupy about 3% of the Earth's land. They accommodate half the world's people, but only 3% of the land. Many of those cities are located on prime agricultural land because that's where there was a food supply surplus to feed people, so people settled there. And that, in many cases, not all, but in many cases. How much agricultural land do we have on the Earth? It's about 10% of the land. If the we're going to double the urban population by 2050. 
if the doubling of the urban population leads to a doubling of urban area, prime agricultural land could be removed from food production. That would be a big problem. So the question is, how will we design this doubling of the cities? Will we contain the growth the way Amsterdam does, which has a green belt right around it? You can get on a bike in Amsterdam and in 20 minutes, you're out in the farms. Or we can do the Los Angeles and New York thing. Endless sprawl. Endless. You have to travel for hours to get out of the city. Next slide. This is in Japan. I know a botanist who lives in that apartment. And from the window you see a rice paddy and buildings. And they're cheek by jowl. They're one right next to the other. So they have a choice and they pre they're preserving their farmland. Uh, Hi. We have parks. But uh, if you go outside of Central Park, and there are other parks too, but I'm talking about at the edges, there's kind of this uh, spread. It's concrete. It's concrete for a long way in uh, New Jersey and upstate New York. Next slide, please. Cities are concentrated in low elevation coastal zones. That's no surprise. They want two reasons for that. One is rivers run downhill and they deposit the alluvial soil at the mouth of the river when they slow down. So that's a good place for farming. Secondly, it's a great place to be for commerce. Thirdly, this is the third of the two reasons I was giving you, there's the ocean gives you a source of food. Do you know that there are three kinds of people in the world? Those who can count and those who can't? Okay, next slide, please. So we're going to take a look at some pictures here. This is New York City as it now is. Next slide. Keep your finger on the button. This is one meter submerged. This is six meters submerged. Now, I object to this because my favorite nudist colony right here would be underwater. That would be terrible. Next slide. Next slide. This show, no, push one more. This shows that in the parts that would be submerged, there's a very high density of population. It's not that it would be the parks, it would be where people are living. Next slide. This is Eastern England. There's London, Birmingham, Manchester. Next slide. Take away one meter. Take, next slide. Take away six meters. Next slide. This is Shanghai. Next slide. One meter. Next slide. Six meters. Next slide. Amsterdam, Northern Netherlands. Next slide. One meter. Next slide. Six meters. Next slide. Florida. You can kiss Florida goodbye. And much of the Louisiana Delta. Next slide. Okay, so we have talked about history, population, economics, environment, and culture. Future population trends, bigger, slower, older, more urban. How are we doing on time? Well, I'm going to have to be brief. Okay. Opportunities. Next slide. I see two opportunities that are germane to population. So I'm not going to talk about the design of housing or of commercial buildings. That's very important, but that's not within my expertise or scope here. Education is and contraception is. Next slide. So I'm going back to the thing about bigger. We are, this is history up to, let's say, 2010, 2005. If today's fertility rates persist, we'll have the black line, and in 2050, we'll have 12 billion people. Nobody expects today's fertility to persist. It's in decline. We expect it to continue to decline. That gives us the median projection of 9.2 billion people. That's the UN's best estimate for 2050, 9.2 billion. If women and men choose to have half a child more per woman, now I'm, that means one child more per two women, okay? Half a child more per woman than assumed in these projections from now to 2050, we get 10.8 billion in 2050. That's an increase of 1.6 billion. 
On the other hand, if women choose to have half a child less than assumed, we get 7.8 billion. The difference between 10.8 and 7.8 billion, it's 3 billion people, the population of the world in 1960, is a consequence of a child per woman difference. One child between now and 2050 means a difference of 3 billion people. Okay, next slide. I'm going to summarize the next three slides and go through them quickly. Women with education, in general, on the average, start having children later, have fewer children, and take better care of their children so that they survive better. And where education of high quality is available, women seek it for its own sake, its own value. Next slide. So let's, let's, I want to just show you the numbers. This is the fraction of 15 to 19 year olds who were either mothers already or pregnant with their first child in Uganda, Bangladesh, Mali, etc. If you've had some secondary education, it's 17%. With none, no schooling, it's 60%. Bangladesh, 21% versus 56. And you can see what the trend is. Some schooling, some secondary schooling, lowers the f early entry into motherhood. Next slide. Well, you're really, as a statistician, I must protest. There's a difference between correlation and causality. That is true. And it's a very good observation. So the women who get some secondary education may be much richer, may be advantaged by their background. And that, Yossi Renat is one of the world's great mathematicians statisticians, probabilist statisticians, and what he said is absolutely right. What was his comment? He says, I should not confuse correlation with causation. There is an association here. On the other hand, we also know that we're, so you're right, I, I don't have time here to go into the studies where if you introduce education in comparable districts within a same country and you don't in others, you get a rapid decline in fertility where it's been introduced. So you can do ethically acceptable, randomized experiments in, let's say, districts in Kenya. Suppose you're working with an NGO, and they don't have the resources to provide schooling to everybody at once. You get the agreement of the local people, we're going to do this in a sequence of stages. And now we randomize at that point and we pick the units randomly. So it really is a randomized experiment. Then we can measure the fertility decline that's associated with the introduction of the schooling or any other in intervention. That's how you can ethically uh, do experiments to find out what works. And uh, those experiments, I don't have time to go into them here, but have shown significant and rapid reductions. So there is auxiliary evidence that supports the intervention here, although the factors you alluded to as possibly working are certainly there. You had a question. But if you pass education only to one district, doesn't it just give the, them an advantage over the others? If you give it to everyone, then it doesn't mean that everyone is going to gain from it. Income, better jobs. Here it nice for them. Okay. Their education is just a means for reducing the bill. <laughs> well, I, I don't see education as just a means for education. But for this exercise. For this exercise, what I want to show is what are the fertility consequences of something that's good in itself. That's my, my point is people want education if it's available to them and if it's of good quality, not just sitting in a schoolroom. But you're saying, isn't education comparative advantage rather than absolute advantage? There is some truth in that. But there's also, so if my district gets it before your district, I have an advantage over your district. But we both have an advantage in a world market where the competitors have education and we don't. So if we can lift our entire country up, we are more able to enter a world market. So always lean on someone else having less education eventually? Not necessarily. It means us, it, I don't think so. It allows us to enter into commerce with, and I mean commerce intellectual as well as financial, with the rest of the economy. Otherwise, we're left out. 
So it's not, it doesn't hurt. Listen, I like to be in a room full of smart people because the conversation is more interesting. And it's the same thing. If you have a world of educated countries, the conversation can be more interesting. And the production, and, and for the United States, we make stuff like software and music. We want to sell it to rich people. Our products mainly are good for rich people. So it's to our advantage to have rich people on the buying side. We can discuss it. Okay, next slide. So I, was, I wanted to show that this... The, next slide, please. You didn't mention the family structure, family situation. <laughs> can we hold that to the questions? <laughs> Women who completed secondary school, this is to show that at the end of their reproductive careers, women who have had secondary have fewer children than women who have had primary only or no education. And the difference is more than one child per woman. Remember, one child per woman makes a difference of three billion people in 2050. By completing secondary, subject to the caveat, there's plausible evidence that it would reduce fertility by a child more or less per woman. Next slide. And again, the same question of correlation here, but it's again plausible because we've introduced public health measures. Children of better educated mothers die much less frequently before age five. Next slide. Second opportunity. Contraception, voluntary, and maternal and health services. Next slide. Somewhere between 100 million and 200 million women had an unmet need for contraception in developing countries and former Soviet republics 2000. So what does unmet need mean? A woman has an unmet need for contraception if she is fecund. That means biologically able to have a child. Not every woman is. Sexually active, not every woman is. And not using any contraceptive method and does not want a child for at least two years. If a woman is pregnant or amenorrheic after giving birth, she is considered to have an unmet need if she had not wanted the pregnancy or birth, either when it occurred or ever. If you use a slightly more generous definition, there are 200 million. So there's a lot of people who would like to have contraception and can't get to it. Next slide. If unmet needs were met, the cost of contraceptive services to these 200 million women would be about $4 billion a year. That is maybe a week of the United States bailout plans for the uh, failed investment banks. These services would avert 52 million unintended pregnancies a year. Did you know that there are a lot of unintended pregnancies? More than 50 million a year? 23 million unplanned births, 22 million induced abortions. Why? Because women get pregnant and they don't want to be pregnant and then they have induced abortions. 7 million spontaneous abortions and 1.4 million infant deaths. Where contraceptive and reproductive health services are available, women seek them for their own value. I'm not trying to ram this down anybody's throat or other orifices. This is something that people want. Next slide. Here's the summary. Remember, in 23 hours, you're going to test yourself. Population interacts with economics, environment, economy, and culture. Next slide. Thank you for your extraordinary patience and for your questions. Okay, that was an hour and five minutes. Sorry. We can have questions for a while. Anybody who needs to leave, it's a good time. Nope, no embarrassment, you stayed. So, are there any questions? I, I, Okay, let's start. We'll, we'll make a sweep over here. We'll, we'll go around and then we'll go back. Okay? Leon. Okay, your, the projection, not your necessarily projection, the projections for human population growth is that this is assuming there's no... Wait, 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 wait. Stand up and project so I don't have to repeat the question. <laughs> you'll, you'll repeat it anyway. No, go. Okay, so your, the projections that were made uh, were with the assumption that there are no uh, pandemic uh, disasters. No more pandemic disasters than we had in the last century, including the flu and so on. Okay, but uh, particularly because uh, with the population increasing 
and more people be living in, in uh, urban areas, your nearest neighbor being nearer, uh, what's going to be the consequences of, of infection rates and uh, how might that affect the population? Did you hear the question? Yeah. Okay. It's a very good question. Um, the recent, I'm not speaking about the future, the, the recent within the last few months experience of the swine flu epidemic in the United States compared to Mexico shows that if you have good health care, you can prevent the mortality consequences of a widespread influenza epidemic. So we've had very few deaths and a lot of sickness. And what we have now that we didn't have in 1918 is antibiotics, which don't deal with the virus at all, but stop the secondary bacterial infections that kill people. When people live in cities, it's much easier to get health care to them than when they are dispersed out in the countryside. And the health, public health infrastructure is much better. The notification systems, everything's easier in a city for providing health. It could go either way. We don't know. But the increases are going to be in developed countries. Right. So there it's going to be a problem unless we decide to do something about it. Unless the United States recognizes it's in our interest to have good surveillance and rapid action teams to go to developing countries and contain, treat, and deal with uh, these epidemic outbreaks. So again, we have choices about what we, how we respond to it. It's a good question, but I, we could have catastrophes. I've been studying influenza the last few years, and I'm aware of that this H1N1 current virus is in the same group as the 1918 virus. It has swine components, it has human components, and it has avian components. If they become person-to-person -person transmissible more effectively, and if it becomes virulent, we could have a real problem, but it doesn't necessarily have to do that. So, yes, sir. You said that such a population boom will not happen again. Are you saying it generally, or are you limiting yourself to a few, to a hundred years or so? Because if you're saying it, either you're saying that population will deteriorate and will not come out, either it will be stable, but you're not considering it will become cyclical, like in many biological systems. Yeah, I agree with you. I do not think uh, that it will become stable. And I don't see an endless sinking demand. I could imagine... It's going to be cyclical. I don't say cyclical because that implies too much regularity. I say there will be random fluctuations on the scale of centuries up and down, but not necessarily periodic. I doubt that there will be growth rates as rapid as those we experienced in the 20th century because the costs of rapid growth are very high. The social and personal costs in terms of careers and infrastructure. So I expect modulated drifting. I don't expect very rapid growth and I don't expect catastrophic decline. That's an equivocal answer. And why don't we agree to meet in 300 years and see who's right? Okay? I'll meet you right here. Dan. I was wondering uh, about the... Stand up and so people can hear you. Population growth depends very essentially on fertility, which is choice of individual people. Yes, that... And what has been done or could be done to modify their choices in the right way? You hear the question? No. Was that a no? No. Yes, it was a no. no. Yes, it was a no. The question was, fertility is a choice of individual people. What can be done or what should be done to modify those choices in the right direction? Did I correct? Well, I have offered two opportunities. One is reproductive health services and contraception, availability for voluntary adoption, and secondly, education. If I had to choose one or the other, which do I think is much more important? Education, no doubt about it. Why is that? Because educated people can generate income, and if they want contraception, they go buy it. But without education, you can't even use the contraception very well. 
and you don't have the motivation to use it. What we need is a shift from quantity of children to quality of children. And that has happened in a lot of cultures, but not all. Uh, Barbara, uh, you heard it. please stand up. You're getting to my question. If you could just uh, outline for us a little bit more in detail what are the mechanisms through which you, you believe that the increase in secondary education specifically will lead to decreased fertility? Okay. How does it work? <coughs> That's a, so the question is, what are the mechanisms by, by which education leads to decreased fertility? Fertility as expressed number of children. Well, when people are in school, they get married less frequently. If people have an incentive to pursue their studies because they can see that there's a carrot at the end of that stick, they will take fewer risks of pregnancy. And if they do get pregnant, they will try to terminate the pregnancy. So we know that both boys and girls who have a prospect through education of some kind of advancement, however they see that, generally are, have much reduced unintended fertility during their teenage years. And then education gives women an alternative to achieving status through childbearing. It gives them the opening of a professional career so they can make a choice because they can enter a marketplace versus staying home and having children. Uh, there are books that answer your question. No, I I'm, know. I'm just, just giving. Uh, yeah. Where you think. So that that's. Eitan, please stand. By the way, you know, answer to the question, to Yossi's question, Yossi Renaud's question, you know, of course, the Caroline. Wait, sp speak up so other people can hear. I'm saying that in your answer to Yossi's question about the correlation of developing Caroline, for example, in India, is a good example of the result of education. Thank you. Uh, in your, the population projections, uh, you, you extensively looked at alternative assumptions about fertility. But another word was said about longevity assumptions and the relation with longevity. <coughs> it's because you assume that this is a very stable trend, which there's not much possibilities because something has to do with quality. Yes. All of the UN projections assume a gradual improvement out to a life expectancy in the middle 80s for men and women. And leveling off. And a leveling off. They have also taken account of the AIDS epidemic, which in some countries shortened life expectancy by decades and remains a huge problem in sub-Saharan Africa. The UN projections assume that the AIDS epidemic will come under control. But while we're on the question of mort mortality, in round numbers, AIDS kills about 3 million people. Let me, let's start with a big picture. Roughly speaking, 135 million births a year, 55 million deaths a year. Difference is 80 million. That's the rate of increase of the population. 135, 55. Okay? AIDS kills 3 million people a year. Tuberculosis kills 2 million people a year. Malaria kills 1 million people a year. Add those together, 3 plus 2 plus 1, you'll see how much does that come to? <laughs> 6 million, it's the first perfect number. And tobacco kills more than AIDS, TB, and malaria. Now that's the serious point. Tobacco kills about 10% of people. 10% of the deaths every year are due to tobacco. 55 million, five and a half million, six million. It's the largest preventable cause of death. And the United States subsidizes its tobacco countries, companies to sell in developing countries. The rich countries have caught on to this. They are making public health rules to reduce incentives to reduce tobacco use. Instead, we're selling it to the poor countries. That is a scandal. So talk about longevity. We know what to do. Stop tobacco. Sorry. 
<laughs> uh, Alan. I just wanted to ask a more general question. Please, please stand up, because I... You're, you're, thank you. I wanted to ask you more, a slightly more general question. You've talked several times during the lecture about we have choices. Uh, we have choices, and we have choices that matter now. So when you say we have choices, do you, do you have a view about the role of the international policy community in, these, in all these big matters? I mean, what, how do we express our choices? Through our uh, dollars, through how, what we buy, what we sell, or through our uh, international political mechanisms, or the UN, or do you have a view about that? Yeah, I do. Good. I, I think everything we do is a choice. And there are opportunities to make constructive choices at every scale from the individual, through the family, through the, all the social units you belong to, your school, your synagogue, your church, no matter what it is, your Boy Scout troop, all the way up. I am not just talking abstractly. I don't think we can leave it to the international policy community. First of all, let's say six of the 6.8 billion people on the planet have never heard of the international policy community. And really, you know, they've they got their own fish to fry. But what, what choices am I talking about? Well, cotton shirts. Let's talk about cotton shirts. I like a cotton shirt. This doesn't happen to be cotton. A cotton shirt is an incredibly water-intensive luxury because it takes about 20 tons of water to grow one kilogram of cotton fiber in United States agriculture, irrigated cotton agriculture. Because we lose 90% of the water before it gets to the plant. So we went from 20 tons down to one ton of effective water. Now why does it take a ton of water to grow a kilogram of cotton? Because half the plant is no good for fiber. So we have to grow two kilograms of cotton plant. And pl cotton plants have something called a transpiration ratio. It's how much water you have to put into a pot of that plant over a year to get one kilogram of the plant at the end. You have to put in 500 times as much weight of water to get one kilogram of cotton. We need two kilograms because we only get one, cotton, one kilogram of cotton fiber from a two kilogram plant. So we need a ton of water over a year for one kilogram of fiber and we waste the other 19 tons. Now let's talk about nylon. This happens to be a nylon shirt because I'm traveling and I've got to be able to wash this so I can wear it again. <laughs> nylon. Where does nylon come from? It's made by adipic acid. Where do you get adipic acid? From corn cobs. So you grow the grain to feed to people or animals, and the waste product you process with no additional water consumption. And you get nylon fiber. Not everybody likes nylon. I have some nylon shirts and I have some cotton shirts. I'm not saying we have to go crazy. I'm just saying we have to know what our choices are. Now let's put up some water for tea. Should we fill the kettle or not? No, we shouldn't. We should heat up as much as we want. Should we put it in the microwave or should we put it on the stove? Well, I think the most energy efficient way to heat water for tea is an immersion coil. Because it doesn't heat up anything but the hot water. But where does the electricity come from? Well, it depends where you buy it. I mean, this could go on forever, okay? Our choices Collectively, we don't think about it. Every time we, you know, you turn on the water to take a shower and you let it run, you're shaving. Do you fill the basin or do you let the water run? When you brush your teeth, you turn off the water. I mean, all of our choices. I told you the joke about the guy who couldn't get out of bed. I mean, if you really take this seriously, you, you have to think about a lot of things. But not only the individual, because that's not enough. You have to get political action. Why does our country, my country, United States, support tobacco subsidies? We should not be doing that. You know, um, why are we selling arms to a lot of people? We should not be doing that. So political activity, 
Financial contributions are very important. Intellectual contributions are important. Understanding how the world works is a contribution. And there are a lot of academics here, and that's an important contribution. It helps if they're interested in translating that into policy and action. So the answer to your question, which is an excellent question, is there are infinite opportunities, and we have to just be creative about looking for them and take action and encourage our friends, family, and neighbors, and so on to take action. It's, it's very important that we see the world as subject to influence. And it says in the Torah, you are not obliged to complete the work, but neither are you free to desist from it. So I don't feel defeated if I don't achieve what I'm after completely, but I'm still obligated to go and try. And that's, you know, I think that's, that, that's, that's where we are. We have to keep trying. So let's go this way. Please, sir. And then, then you. But this gentleman. Please stand up and, and shout. Uh, demography today and projections are somewhat decoupled from carrying capacity of regional and global systems as well. So as someone with background in ecology, what is your input? These projections don't take into consideration the carrying capacity of the local and global areas. So what, why is that? So how can you do put it into implementation? I did not pay this young man to ask that question. Did you hear the question? Um, these projections don't take account of the carrying capacity either locally or globally. How can I take account of uh, the carrying capacity in these, in these uh, projections? Is that fair? So in 1991, a journalist called me up and said, uh, how many people can the Earth support? And I said, I'll get back to you with an article in six weeks because that's my business and I should know the answer to that question. And he said, I want 3,500 words. I said, easy, no problem. So I worked like a dog for six weeks and I wrote 10,000 words. And I sent it to the guy and he said, we can only publish 3,500 words. So they cut two-thirds of my brilliant essay, which made me so annoyed and I was so puzzled by what I had found, because I couldn't find an answer to the question, that I began a project which lasted for four and a half years. The, my answer to your question is in a book which I wrote called How Many People Can the Earth Support? <laughs> question mark. That's why I said, and, and if you'd like to buy some, you can buy it on Amazon. It's a real bargain. It's 550 pages of distilled wisdom. The problem is, well, let me, let me give you the empirical results and then the conceptual. So I spent several years reviewing all the published scientific estimates I could find of how many people the Earth could support, starting with Antony von Leeuwenhoek in 1679 who estimated that the world could support about 12 billion people. And how he did that is a fascinating study. I can tell you about that, but that's too long an answer. And then I traced all these estimates. I got 66 of them. In the last half century, between 1950 and 2000, the estimates of the Earth's carrying capacity ranged from less than 1 billion to more than 1,000 billion, a trillion. They can't all be right. And I learned that these numbers are political numbers. They're not scientific numbers. If you talk about measuring the speed of light, at the beginning, your techniques are lousy and different people get different answers. As time goes on, the answers converge. And now we know the speed of light to, I don't know, 10 decimal places. Now you look at the graph of estimates of how many people can the Earth support. We start with von Leeuwenhoek at 10 at 12 billion. The answers diverge like that. That's not progress. But it does reveal that the question is a political one because different people make different assumptions about how people will live. Some people assume that just the maximum we can stack people in boxes and feed them is the limit. But nobody wants that. So then the question is values. What's going to be the average level of income? 
What's going to be the distribution of the level of income? That's a value question. What's going to be the technology that we use? How are we going to settle our political conflicts? By violence or by discussion? What kind of an economic system are we going to have? Are we going to have a state command and control? Or are we going to let people's own incentives be part of the answer? And over what time frame are we talking about? We've got plenty of oil for the next five years. For the next 50 years, probably not. For 500 years, definitely not. So what do people want from life? You know, Manhattan has some fabulously expensive real estate, but in the middle of it, there are these churches and synagogues which serve no useful purpose. People aren't living in them. They're not growing food there. So why do we do that? It's values. People think they serve some purpose, but it's not an economic production. How much time are we going to, how much space are we going to set aside for spiritual reasons? Our park system, our churches, our synagogues. These are value questions. So my answer to you is, I can summarize my 550 page book in two words, it depends, or in four words, population, economics, environment, and culture. You have to think about those things. And if you want a longer answer, there are 11 questions that are really implied by what sounds like a scientific question, but is ill-framed. We don't know how to measure human carrying capacity, either locally or globally. That's my considered belief at this point. I might change my mind, but I, so far, I haven't seen any evidence that we know how to do that. Good question. Thank you. Sir, did you have a question? Was it you? Yes. Oh, we had lunch. Good. Thank you. And by the way, the speaker gave a course using the title of my book, How Many People Can the Earth Support? Which shows excellent judgment, don't you think? And the answer was the one you gave. Um, when you mentioned water, then how did you work water into uh, your projection? Because water plays several directions. I mean, if uh, you talk about the population growth in the urban centers, you essentially are talking about growth of shanty towns. That's how you accommodate such a rapid growth. You can't accommodate it in another way. Which means you have sanitation issues, which and actually this way it causes mortality. You have diarrhea and dysentery. As far as I know, they are major causes in terms of mortality. True. The other side is the supply of water and potable water, which has a very steep energy cost once you get into this kind of situations. So I was wondering how it was working into your projection. Did you hear the question? How do the projections take account of shortages of water? And the answer is they don't at all. Uh, but it's a, it's a serious problem. Let me just say, even here, there's room for intelligence. For example, why do I flush my toilet with drinking water? Because the plumbing system was designed in an era of abundance, and it was cheaper to flush the toilet with drinking water than to provide a dual system where I would capture the water from the guy upstairs shower and use it to flush the toilet. We could, okay, so my university has a green committee. I'm on the green committee. We have installed waterless toilets. And I saw some here in Israel somewhere, somewhere in the last couple of days I've been traveling. I saw waterless toilets. There are things you plunk them into urinals for men, okay? You plunk it into the wall, it's got a little uh, chemical disc at the bottom and a drain pipe, but there's no inflow water at all. It saves 40 to 45,000 gallons a year, pardon me for using imperial units, Some, a lot of water. It does not smell, it costs 30 bucks, much less than the water would cost. And you don't need water to flush urinals, absolutely not. The Japanese have toilets where after you flush the toilet, water comes up out of a spigot, you wash your hands, the basin is over the water chest. So there's a basin there with a hole and it, the water you wash your hands and goes straight into the water chest. The next time you flush, it goes and flushes the toilet. It's, I saw this when I was hiking in the countryside. Why don't we have that? It's such a simple, effective, economical device. It's just a matter of making it. 
Nobody in the United States makes it. I've been trying to get my university to do that. All right, what about the price system? That's a good thing. So we should, we're, thank you, thank you, thank you. You're giving me hints. So the answer is we don't price water properly. In the United States, again, well, uh, do we really have shortage or not? I guess that depends on whom you ask. Uh, the salmon in the rivers who are dying because the water is being drained from the rivers to irrigate land that's being wastefully irrigated think we have a problem. But it's not reflected in the price system. So the price system is a solution as long as the price system takes account of all the values that are concerned. And, or at least enough of them, enough of them to, uh, to be useful to reflect all of our values. But thank you, that, that's a very good observation. We don't price water in any reasonable way. We have these, in the United States, these hereditary water rights. They're nuts. People in the 1850s got rights to a certain amount of water and it hasn't changed since then because it's politically impossible. So economics is great, but the politics is also important. Politics is a big part of water, as I'm telling you here in the Middle East. Okay, you guys are terrific. Thanks a lot.